divine worship this morning. It's a special uh, pleasure on behalf of our congregation to welcome the Reverend Paul Siler and uh, his wife Carol, who will each be leading uh, our service this morning. But well, it is a uh, joy to be here today, to be able to come and to uh, meet with you both and to lead you in worship. Uh, let us hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 27 and verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let's join together with the doxology how good is the God who is the Lord. Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we join together this Lord's Day morning. We come with thanksgiving, we come with praise and honour to a most great and wonderful God. Father, we thank you for your love. We praise you that you are a God who is sovereign over all things because you are the creator and that you are bringing all things in this world to that ultimate conclusion and plan and purpose that you purposed even from before the foundation of the world. And Father, we thank you that nothing can happen in this world apart from your will. We take comfort in knowing that everything that happens in our own lives is part of your will for us. And Lord, we pray in thanksgiving that the day is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will return in all of his glory, majesty and dominion, a day when every knee will bow before him and every tongue confess that he is indeed Lord. And so, Father, may the day hasten for his coming. And, Lord, it is our great joy and, uh, and privilege to be here, to be able to worship you. And, Father, we pray that you would help us to worship in spirit and in truth and that, Lord, by your word, that we may be encouraged and build up this day, encouraged in our faith, that we may not just simply be hearers of the word, but that we may be doers of the word, that we may follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking and endeavouring to bring glory and honour and praise to his name in all that we do. And Father, these things we pray through Christ our Saviour. Amen. Well, let's uh, join together with the hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Thank you. 
from the Old Testament, from Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skilful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. The chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. Nazariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favour and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs has assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed to you and deal with your servants according to what you see. And so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and their wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom 
and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of that time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Amen, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his most holy word. Let us uh, come before the Lord in prayer as we would acknowledge our sins. Most holy and righteous and good God, we come before you humbly, recognising, Lord, that we were born in sin. Father, we know that we have by nature the disposition of Adam, that you created Adam and Eve and placed them in the Garden of Eden in paradise, giving them great abundance and liberty. But they use that liberty against you to break the commandments of God, to eat the forbidden fruit. And thus when Adam fell, all the human race fell in him. And so, Father, we come before you acknowledging that we are by nature sinners and that, Father, we fall short of your glory. That even though we may be born again, and have your spirit living in us. Nevertheless, we grieve the Holy Spirit through sinful conduct. Lord, we have sinned in word, thought, and in deed. Father, we know that in so many ways we fall short. Instead of trusting and depending upon you, we trust in other things. We turn away from you. Lord, we know that, as the Bible says, that we are all like sheep who stray and go away from the Good Shepherd. And so, Father, for all of our sins, uh, whatever we may have done, Lord, these we humbly confess before you and seek that forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, we want to thank you that you did all that was necessary to secure our salvation, to secure our forgiveness, because the Lord Jesus Christ died on a Roman cross, taking upon himself the sins of his people so that when we are joined to him, our sins are forgiven. And so, Father, we humbly confess these sins with acknowledgement that as we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, thank you for that wonderful salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. So we are going to join together with the hymn, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine.
Now, our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 9 and verses 18 through 24. Now, it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him and asked him, Who do the crowds say that I am? Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And then the reading from the epistle of 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit and the glory of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yes, for it is time for the judgment to begin at the household of God. It begins with us. What will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Very warm welcome to us all this morning. And uh, again, I'm delighted to welcome on your behalf the Reverend Paul Siler and Carol. Uh, uh, Paul, of course, will be bringing the message to us afterwards, but before that, uh, Carol uh, will be looking after the young people and the rest of us, of course, too. Just draw your attention to the various notices as printed in the bulletin, and uh, I'd just like to emphasise the points that Guido makes each time he preaches, that when you go home after the service this morning, please take these bulletins with you and uh, as the week progresses, give them the attention that their importance demands. Now, there'll be a combined uh, worship uh, at Nunda at uh, 6 o'clock this evening, but in the afternoon, just refer you to this flyer that you have in with your order of service uh, with the mission focus, which commences at half past four, with the speaker and leader being the Reverend Ashley uh, Saunders. Next Sunday, uh, divine service in the church here at uh, not nine in the morning, and uh, I'm assuming it'll be a combined service uh, next Sunday in the evening, Virginia. Thank you. There are the various other uh, midweek uh, activities there. There's a session meeting uh, tomorrow evening and the women's fellowship and youth groups, young adults later in the week and the prayer meeting at Nanda at uh, half past seven on um, Saturday morning. A happy birthday to uh, those who are having or have had uh, birthdays. Uh, 
to Toby for yesterday, um, Peter, Hannah, uh, and uh, Obang for the coming week. And we wish them all a very happy birthday indeed. Thanks, Carol. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Now, I've brought a picture here to show you. Today's story is going to be about, well, some of the story is going to be about food. What have we got here in this picture? Can you tell me? Yeah, what kind of food? There's two different types of food. What's this? Meat, that's right. Who likes eating meat? Yeah, most people do, hey. Who prefers to eat vegetables? Most of us like our meat first, don't we? Well, today's story is going to be about a man called Daniel, and he loved eating meat, but he said, no, I'm not going to eat meat because I love God so much and it would be bad for me to eat meat. So that's going to be our story, part of our story today anyway. Okay, in the Bible there's a book called Daniel. Daniel was a young man who prayed three times a day to God. He loved God so much in his heart. Oh, I bet you guys, I don't pray three times a day. But Daniel did. There he is, up at his, and he went to the window. He wasn't ashamed of praying. Went to the window, open window, and all the people kept seeing him praying three times a day. He loved God in his heart so much. And he always tried to keep God's rules. Now, there's ten very special rules in the Bible. Does anyone know what they're called? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, that's right. They're written in the Bible in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. The first one is, does anyone know the first commandment? Oh, dear, this is a hard question, isn't it? You shall love the, you shall have no other gods before me. So I love God the most in our heart. That means we can only worship God, the true God in heaven. <clears throat> other people worship different gods, but they are only made of wood or stone or other metals, and they are only um, made from people. They're not real gods. The people are mistaken when they worship these gods. Daniel knew God's rules, and one day the, some people tried to trick him and make him eat food that was dedicated to a different god. He'd been taken into a different country called Babylon and they ate foods like meat that we saw before and the meat was dedicated to this other different God and, and Daniel felt in his heart, no, I'm not going to eat that meat. I want to eat just vegetables and water. So he asked the ruler if he could um, be allowed, him and his three other friends, if him... Him and his three other friends could have a special diet that was only vegetables and water, and then he was allowed to do that. Daniel was very brave doing this, as he could have been in really big trouble off the king for doing it, but God was with him and protected him. Later in Daniel's life, again, he's, when he was praying three times a day, some the people who were watching him didn't, like that, and they tricked the king into making a rule not to pray to any other god. But Daniel thought, no, I'm going to keep God's rules and I'm going to keep praying to God. And the people went and told the king. And Daniel, do you know what happened? Do you know that story? Do you know what happened? What happened, Kurt? The, and they threw them in, Daniel into the lions. That's right. There's Daniel. But guess what God did? God loved Daniel because Daniel loved God and was always good. So God sent a special angel down to protect Daniel and he shut them, he stopped, he put his hand up and said, stop, lions, and they were friendly to Daniel. They didn't eat him. They closed their mouths up tight and they didn't eat him. So God did a wonderful miracle in protecting Daniel. 
from the low ends. You know, the Bible says, love the Lord your God in Matthew. That's a memory verse. We can learn that one. That's a good one to learn. It's from Matthew. And I've got a sheet to give you afterwards that you can do, and it's got the memory verse on it. The Bible says, love the Lord your God. And if we love God and keep his ways, God will look after us in life and we'll have a very happy life. There's a song about... Daniel, and it says, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose, dare to make it known. And Daniel did all those things, didn't he? And it's hard, you know, to stand alone. If all your friends at school were saying, oh, come on, come and do this with us, we're throwing stones at some other kid. It's hard to say, no, I'm not joining in. That's not right. God wouldn't want me to do that. Very hard to stand alone and do what God wants us to do, but sometimes we've got to be brave and pray to God in our heart and help us to do the right thing so that God will be happy with it. I just recently wrote uh, here in Brisbane a young uh, 10-year-old girl from a Christian home was asked a question at her primary school by a fellow student. She was asked the question, do black lives matter? And she responded by saying, yes, black lives matter because all lives matter. Her comments were reported to the principal and she was suspended for three days. It was a bit hard to understand. Now, it's actually not easy being a Christian young person today. I recall about 30 years ago, a young woman in the 12th grade, she indicated to me that she'd been at school in a science class and she had indicated that she believed in six days creation The teacher gave her a hard time and so did the students. And it's even harder and getting much harder in school and university these days, Uh, particularly in the light of the fact that there are major changes in the attitude towards sexuality and gender identity. Indeed, it is getting much harder for Christians to live a life for God in what really we would have to say is a pagan society. Those of us... uh, who are over 50, were blessed really to grow up in a society that uh, was at least tolerant and mostly respectful of Christianity. But that isn't the case today, that uh, there have been very significant changes take place in Australian society, and not just simply Australian society, but this really is occurring right around the Western world. Uh, The fact is that there is a very powerful intellectual elite who very often control much of what goes on in education and what goes on in the media. And uh, many of these people are God-hating people. They want to take out of the Western society uh, our Christian heritage. And so there is this very powerful elite at work. Uh, I mean, I found it quite incredible that on December the 9th, 2017, the Marriage Act in Australia was changed to allow for so-called marriage equality. How did that happen? I mean, if you would have gone back 50 years, a referendum like that would have never, ever passed something like this. But it happened, and it shows and demonstrates that what is happening in the West, and Australia is hardly alone in this way, that there is the intellectual elite is seeking to force its ideas upon our society. And uh, as I say, it's happening all over the world, that there are this group of people that are atheistic, worldly and passionately anti-Christian. For example, many of the troubles that are being experienced in the United States at the moment, uh, with this, for example, Black Lives Matter, what a lot of people don't understand is actually a political group is not really about uh, racism at all. You see, the point is this. We know as Christians that we're all made equal before God. There's absolutely no place for racism in the Christian church. Uh, But this Black Lives Matter, the leaders of this movement have actually self-confessed Marxists. 
And so what we're talking about is a polit political movement that is actually seeking to undermine the uh, whole of American society. Now, of course, there, there have been terrible things done to black people in America, no question about that, and indeed not just simply there but many places. But this movement is really a political movement. You see, that what we need to understand is that there are sinister forces of evil at work in society. It shouldn't surprise us because, I mean, the Apostle Paul says that exactly over in Ephesians chapter 6 where he says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And I think that the question that we as Christians face is this. How do we who are Christians stand firm for the Lord Jesus Christ in a society that Australia, no longer could you even call it a Christian society, is becoming increasingly a pagan society. And we who are Christians stand out as different from that. But how can we stand? And this is why, and why I say these things because the answer is really found right here in the book of Daniel. As we look at Daniel, because he is set forth in the scripture as an example of what we should be like in our day, that he stood against those forces of evil that were working to shape him into being godless and he resisted them as did his three friends. So we're going to look today at this first chapter of Daniel. So in the first chapter of Daniel we read how God gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of the Babylonians and this occurred in the year 605 BC. Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem captive and, uh, and this was the first wave of people from Judah who were actually taken in to the land of Babylon. Uh, they, uh, we often hear of the 70-year captivity, but not everybody was there for 70 years. This was the first wave and Daniel was among that small number of Jews that were taken. You see, and the reason he was taken is Nebuchadnezzar was a very clever king and uh, he had a vast empire to control. And so he determined to select young men from the nations that he had conquered, bring them back to Babylon, educate them in the way of the Babylonians and then actually send them back to their countries as administrators who would be loyal then to Babylon. That, it, that was his uh, uh, purpose. Now King Nebuchadnezzar then issued a command for Ashpenaz who was a court official to set, select young men from the captives of Judah to be trained up to be administrators in his kingdom. He ordered Ashpenaz to select good-looking, intelligent young men for that purpose. By the way, these young men were probably only about 14 or 15. Now among those chosen were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. They're not the only young Judeans taken, but they were the ones who took a stand for righteousness in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar had a very generous offer. These young men were to get a three-year scholarship in the University of Babylon with no hex fees. At the end of their training, they would have well-paid jobs for life. Very attractive. Not only that, but they would also get to eat from the king's table, and that, you could be sure, was the best food that you could get in Babylon. And uh, really what was going on, and this is a catch, is that he, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was really using brainwashing techniques because he wanted to make these Judeans into good, loyal Babylonians. And one of the things that he did was to change their names. Uh, Daniel's, whose name in Hebrew means God is my judge, was given the Babylonian name Belteshazzar, which meant Bel is my protector. Bel being one of the gods of the Babylonians. Hananiah's Hebrew's name is God is gracious. He was given the Babylonian name Shadrach, which is command of Aku. Aku was the Babylonian moon god. Mishael's Hebrew name was one who is like God. 
and he was given the Babylonian name Meshach, and that is also connected with the worship of the Babylonian moon god Aku. Azaria's Hebrew's name was God will help, and he was given the Babylonian name Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, another Babylonian deity. So clearly Nebuchadnezzar had a purpose. Change their names. If, uh, and if you could remove God from their names, perhaps you could remove God from their hearts. That was his thinking. Now, did Nebuchadnezzar succeed in converting these young men to place their trust in the gods of the Babylonians? Did changing their names turn them away from trusting in the living God? Did three years of training in the Babylonian university get these men to turn away from their commitment to God? And the answer is no. These four young men stood firm against the influences of pagan Babylon. Now, in particular, these young men determined not to defile themselves with the king's food. We read this. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. There he, therefore he requested of the chief of Enoch's that he might not defile himself. Now you might say, well, what exactly is going on here? What is this defilement? Now it could be that the defilement was that they would be forced to eat in eating that food, food that is not kosher. I don't know whether you're familiar with that name, but Jews... Uh, have all these rules and regulations about what foods they can eat. They can't eat pork, they can't eat this and they can't eat that. And uh, it, it may be thought that, that they would be going against those dietary laws that God had set forth in the Old Testament and that they will become ceremony un unclean. But the trouble with that view is that there, there was no problem with drinking wine. Nowhere in the Old Testament is there any command uh, other than a Nazarite vow, but there was no command uh, not to drink wine. Wine was considered as something good. So no moral defilement came about by drinking wine. So what is going on here is that there must have been a moral defilement. This food must have been dedicated to the Babylonian gods and by eating this food or drinking this wine, they were therefore in some way engaged in some form of idolatry. So had Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azari eaten that food, they would have been at least in some way engaged in idolatry. And so they took a stand and uh, they sought permission from the supervisor not to eat that food. Now he was a little bit worried about the request because he thought if they begin to look poor in health, he's likely to lose his head. Uh, so Daniel said, well, look, test us for 10 days. After 10 days, you feed us just vegetables and give us just water to drink. And after 10 days, look at us. And if we're healthier than the others, then act according to what you see. And the Lord God rewarded Daniel and his three friends because at the end of those 10 days, they looked healthier than anyone else. And they stayed on that food for all the time that they were in their training. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's plan, plan then was to turn these young men into loyal Babylonians, but it didn't actually work. As is evident, as you read right through the book of Daniel, that these men were committed to God. So we turn to this important question that I raised before. How are we as Christians living in a pagan world to resist those pagan influences that come upon us in our day? Now, we discern, I think, three important principles of conduct from this chapter. One of them is not perhaps as obvious as it might seem, but, but, the, but the first I would put to you is this. We must raise our children on a strong diet of God's word. So uh, this is uh, uh, evident. As you see these young men, you have to ask yourself this question. How is it possible that these four young men stood strong and firm in their commitment to God? And I think when you consider that they were just very young men, that they had obviously come from good homes. 
And I think that we can see that in the very fact that they were given biblical names. So Daniel's name meant God is my judge. Hananiah meant God is gracious. Mishael meant one who is like God. Azaria means God will help. So it is plainly evident that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azaria, these young men were raised on a diet of God's word. Clearly they, they had godly parents and certainly godly influences, perhaps even a grandmother or a, an uncle or somebody who had obviously taught them the Holy Scriptures so that they would survive in this situation. Now, there is no way that they could have lived exemplary lives in Babylon and re resisted the huge pagan forces that were upon them if they had not been rooted and grounded in the word of God. I mean, this is three, and a, three years or more of, of brainwashing in the University of Babylon. Now, this is most remarkable, and there can be only one explanation, and that is that they had been raised on a sound diet of God's word. Now, remember that Paul, speaking to Timothy, said to him that he had been very blessed because he had been raised in a home where he had been taught the scriptures from his infancy, 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. He says, Paul said to Timothy, but you must continue in the things that which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the Puritans believed that the family was the foundation of a godly society and they were right. The very best things that parents can give their children is to raise their children on a strong diet of the word of God. The future of Christianity in Australia is going to be largely dependent on Christian parents giving their children good, sound biblical teaching so that when they do go to university or whatever, they're going to be able to stand strong. I remember a young man who was raised in the same church that I was as a, a young person, and uh, he came from a good Christian home. He went to Sydney University, and uh, Sydney University at that time, uh, there were a lot of things, a lot of influences in Sydney University, really like any other university. And the interesting thing is, is at the end of his time at uni, he had actually turned away from the Christian faith. However, the good news is this. It was only a momentary thing because three years later he was a committed Christian. And the, the question is this, how was he able to get through university? How was he able, even though he lapsed a little bit at the end of that time, he came back to a sound faith in Jesus Christ? How do you explain it? The answer is he grew up in a good Christian home. Those Christian influences uh, were the thing that brought him through and caused him to be able to overcome some of the pressures that he got in the education he received at Sydney University. So the mo one of the most important things that we can do uh, in standing against all of these pagan influences around us is for Christian parents, and indeed Christian grandparents for that matter, to do all that they can to help these young ones to be thoroughly grounded in the Word of God to saturate them in the word of God. But that brings me to the second point, and that is that we need to saturate ourselves in the word of God if we're going to be able to stand against the pressures of paganism around us. If you read through the first chapter of Daniel, you'll actually find that the words wisdom, knowledge and understanding are repeated over and over again. And uh, that gives us a sense of what this chapter is about. You see, these young men had the wisdom, the knowledge of God and the understanding of God. At the end of this chapter, we're told that they had ten times uh, the knowledge of the Babylonians. Let me read it to you, Daniel 1.20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, astrologers who were in his realm. Now, 
this does not simply mean that they had ten times more knowledge than those around them, but rather that they had sound, true knowledge. Uh, You see, the scripture says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's Proverbs 9.10. You see, what we need to appreciate is that the Babylonians had a tremendous amount of knowledge. For example, the hanging gardens of Babylon were one of the great wonders of the ancient world. The Babylonians knew a lot about engineering. For example, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote that the walls of Babylon were so thick that they could actually have chariot races around the top of those walls. It was a massive city uh, and uh, it was uh, estimated to be about 200,000 people. It covered an area, I think from my calculations, something about the size of, say, Toowoomba. Now, you might say, well, that's not that big, but for the ancient world, that was a massive city. Uh, It was the largest city in the world. The Babylonians, by the way, were great mathematicians. A number of archaeological finds have been discovered demonstrating that they had superior knowledge in mathematics and even a a sort of an ancient form of calculus. Uh, I mean, they needed that sort of skill if they were going to build walls like that around Babylon. But tragically, for all of their knowledge, it was false knowledge, or at least a lot of it was perverted by belief in false gods. I mean, where did astrology come from? I've been absolutely staggered at times to find Christians who believe in astrology. You know, it matters which month of the year that you were born in or something. And you'll find that even uh, some believers have taken on these ideas of astrology. But astrology is a false science. It's not and it's not a science at all. It's part of the occult, forbidden in scripture, and it came from Babylon. They were into all sorts of occultish type thinking. So their knowledge was perverted by belief in false gods and in the occult. Now, in contrast, the knowledge that God gave to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah was true knowledge. And indeed, we know that Daniel was given great insight into understanding dreams. He was able to understand Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He was given great insight and wisdom. And in fact, one of the important things that we find in the book of Daniel is that the book of Daniel is like a signpost pointing forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a tremendous amount in the book of Daniel about the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, It mentions, for example, the Son of Man, and this is a reference to Jesus Christ. And so you could say that Daniel had a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ himself because he was looking forward and given great insight into the coming of Christ. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Colossians says that all wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ so that the greatest knowledge, by the way, that we can have is to have knowledge about the Lord Jesus Christ and about what God did through sending his son into this world as our saviour. Now there is only one true wisdom in this world that will lead us to heaven and that is that wisdom that is rooted in the truth of God's word. So I said, what do we need to do if we're going to protect ourselves against all these pagan influences around us? We need to ground ourselves in the word of God. The apostle, uh, uh, how can we stand then against the pressures to conform to pagan influences of the world? The apostle Paul answers that question in Romans 12, 1 to 2. Paul urged the Roman Christians not to be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And uh, that is very important. Uh, The trouble with many professing Christians today is that their minds are not being shaped by the word of God but by other things. And so people are listening to the television and getting their ideas from the TV. Many, many years ago I remember my father when we were children said, the TV is an instrument of the devil. Well, we were kids and we didn't listen to that. Uh, But I think that he was somewhat of a prophet because there are an awful lot of Uh, things going on with a TV that it can be an instrument of the devil 
pushing ideas that are clearly anti-Christian. I'm not saying everything on TV is bad or everything on the computer is bad, but we need to sift these things in the light of God's word. We need our minds shaped by what is in the word of God, not shaped by the things that come through the television or YouTube or the computer or whatever. We need to sift everything. In other words, we will only stand against the pagan influences around us when we are saturated, as it were, in God's word. But saturating ourselves in God's word is not enough. There's one more thing that is important. We saturate our children in the word of God. We saturate our, ourselves in the word of God. But we need to stand firm on the principles of God's word. And that is what we see here in the book of Daniel. Is And, and Carol mentioned before that song that uh, used to be sung. I don't know whether people sing it much today. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. And, uh, and the whole point in this chapter is that these young men took a stand, a very costly stand. I mean, it was a stand that could have actually cost them their lives, but they were willing to stand. You know, one person standing for God can make a world of difference for example, one German August, Augustinian monk named Martin Luther started a spiritual movement that absolutely revolutionised the church of his day. Uh, he was the person God used to start the Protestant Reformation. I don't know how much you know about his life, but on the 17th of April in the year 1521, he was brought before the most powerful person in the whole of Europe, uh, a man by the name of Charles V. You need to try to imagine this in situation. Here was this uh, monk brought before this entire assembly. All of the heads of the church were there. Here was Charles V, the most powerful man in the world at that time. And Luther was brought and there was a pile of his books at the front. And he was being told by the authorities of the church, look, you've got to recant, you've got to say, look, all of the, that I've written is all wrong. And uh, Luther asked for a day to think about it. He came back the following day. Uh, I, that was the 17th of April, 1521. And uh, he was asked again, will you turn back on all those things that you have written in these books? And this is what he said. He said, unless I am convinced by the testimony of scripture or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in a pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have erred and contradicted themselves. He said, I am bound by scriptures, and, and, and I have quoted, and my conscience, note this, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Now you need to understand that in taking that stand, he was actually putting his life at risk because as soon as he left that council, anybody could have put him to death and, that, and the church would have been jumping for joy. Uh, he was a marked man and it was only because of the providence of God that he wasn't put to death. You see, one person standing for truth can make a difference. Let me tell you the story of a modern Daniel and his wife, Amy MacArthur. They are Christians from Belfast in Northern Ireland who bravely stood against an LBGT activist who targeted their bakery. In 2014, they refused to make a cake with the words, and they were to put the words on the cake, support gay marriage. They refused to do so because of their Christian commitment. The person who wanted them to do this was a man by the name of Mr Gareth Lee. Uh, he took them to court for discrimination. And by the way, the British government paid £240,000 to give him legal help to actually take them to court. They didn't get any help. Uh, and he won the case initially, but they took it to the High Court. And four years later the High Court came back in their favour. So they actually won their court case. But it was a very, very difficult time for this 
this young couple who owned this bakery and took this stand. Mrs Amy MacArthur said the following about her stand. She said, I would say to other Christians, do not be afraid to take your stand for God's word because he is so faithful and he will bring you through it. The past four years has really strengthened my faith in God, his comfort and strength and peace. For that alone, it would have been worth it. You see, they got a lot of uh, flack from the homosexual community uh, from what was taking place. Her husband, Daniel MacArthur, said this judgment carries so much weight because it guarantees free speech for Christians all over the UK. People asked you, was it worth it going through all of this? And I answered them, absolutely yes. So is there ever a time to dare to be a Daniel and to dare to stand alone? We are living in such a time where we must take a stand against all of these pressures to conform us to the world but Paul says, do not be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that comes about by, uh, by having ourselves and doing everything that we can for our children and grandchildren, for anyone really around us, to ground people, to get people to know the Scriptures. Because the more that we know God's Word and the more that we are willing to take a stand on that Word, we will be able to be used by God in these difficult days with all of those precious pagan pressures that are coming upon us here in Australia and right around the Western world. Amen. Sorry about that. When I survey the wondrous cross. Let us uh, come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to bring these gifts and to bring them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that they may be used for the glory of your name and for the extension of your kingdom in the world. Father, we want to thank you for the great joy that it is to be Christians, to be drawn out of darkness and to be brought into the kingdom of light. Father, we pray that you would help us to live in this world in a way that is pleasing to yourself, that we might turn away from everything that is evil. Father, we know that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking to devour us, 
seeking to lead us into corruption and wickedness. We pray, Father, that you would give us the grace and the strength to turn away from everything that is wicked, that we may be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, um, all of those wonderful qualities that come from your Spirit. May they be present in our lives, we pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray for this congregation. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be pleased to use this church uh, and the church, Lord, at Dunder for the glory and the praise and the honour of your name. Lord, that you may be with Guido and keep him in good health and strength as he seeks and endeavours to preach your word from Sunday to Sunday and to pastor this group of people. Lord, we do pray uh, for our denomination. We do pray, Lord, that grace and mercy may be given to those who are in places of leadership in the church, that they may seek and endeavour to glorify you in all that is done. Heavenly Father, we do pray for our nation, and it does indeed disturb us to see that there is such wickedness and evil all around us. Father, we do pray that you would help us to take a firm and strong stand against all unrighteousness and wickedness. You would help us to be brave enough to stand firm in dark days. Lord, that you may fill us with the love of Christ, love for all people. Lord, we pray uh, not only um, uh, for ourselves, but Lord, we pray for this nation. And Father, we pray for fellow believers in many other countries of the world. And we know, Father, that there are many Christians around the world today who are suffering because of uh, their Christian stand. Father, we think of people living in the north of Nigeria with Boko Haram and uh, uh, other terrorist groups that are killing so many people. Lord, may you be with the folk there as they seek to take a stand for righteousness. Uh, And Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. Uh, Lord, we do pray Um, in thanksgiving for Christian organisations around the world that are seeking to help uh, Christians who are being persecuted. We thank you for Barnabas Fund, for all the good that they do in helping those that are persecuted and, Lord, other Christian groups that are doing all that they can to strengthen your church. Father, we pray in thanksgiving that Christ is building his church in the world we think, Lord, uh, also of Christians in China today and, uh, and how difficult it is for Christians in China uh, and in North Korea particularly where just owning a Bible uh, is a prison offence or even being put to death because you're reading the Bible. Lord, we pray for believers that have been persecuted around the world. Lord, we thank you that you are with your people, that you're with us, We pray, Lord, for each and every one who is here today, whatever particular issues, whatever particular difficulties each one might be going through, Lord, give us grace, give us strength, that we may keep our eyes firmly fixed upon you, knowing, Lord, that we can trust you and depend upon you in every circumstance that we never have to fear because God is with us. And, Father, all of these things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, let us uh, join together with our concluding hymn, the hymn A Mighty Fortress. This is actually written by Martin Luther. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing.
Now we join together in the benediction, may the grace of Christ our Saviour.